didn't get that first part recorded, darn it. Okay. All right. So um, as I was saying, one of the things we can do here is there's actually other resonance structures that we can draw, one of which involves pushing an electron over here to this nitrogen. And in order to maintain an octet, when we push this electron pair to this nitrogen, we can push this bond pair off of that uh, nitrogen. And that gets us to a new situation. Remember, double-headed arrow is a resonance structure arrow. Sometimes people accidentally confuse it with equilibrium. And it's not an equilibrium, that's a resonance structure arrow. So you pushed a bond pair on there. We still have four bonds to the central nitrogen. So we're gonna keep that positive charge because I pushed two on and I pulled two off. And the two that came off went to oxygen. So it's gonna pick up a negative charge. That makes sense. It's like a hydroxide, right? One bond, a bunch of lone pairs. That's an O minus. This nitrogen now looks like the nitrogen in N2, normal, no more form, formal charge. So this is a good resonance structure. Let's draw another one. This time, I'm going to do it the other way. I'm going to take um, this lone pair and I'm going to push it on and push this bond off. I'm going to end up with a single bond and a triple bond. And so now I've got an additional lone pair out here and I've lost a lone pair out there and I still have four bonds to that central nitrogen. So it's going to get a plus charge. And this nitrogen on the end now has three lone pairs. So it's going to get a minus charge. Oxygen on the right, three bonds. Like Hydronium, OH3 plus, that's got to have a plus charge. Okay, when you use that electron pair to make a bond, you push it over onto the nitrogen, you develop a positive charge out here. Okay, so what do we think about these resonance structures? The one on the bottom looks kind of crazy. We got an N2 minus and an O plus. That's a lot of negative charge out there on this nitrogen. That's a positive charge on the most electronegative element. This thing kind of looks a little bit weird. So you have too much charge separation, um, but it does satisfy the octet rule. These also satisfy the octet rule. Uh, here you've got a negative charge out in oxygen. That seems like a pretty good situation. It's the most electronegative element. Here we've got a negative charge on nitrogen as opposed to oxygen. It's the lesser, less electronegative element um, than oxygen is, but both of these really are good descriptors. Okay, so um, you might say, well, this one's the best one because of electronegativity reasons. And I think that that's true, okay? This one is the best one for electronegativity reasons, but both of these are important descriptors. Okay, so we're gonna transition now and start talking about VSEPR, which is the a valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. It is, in fact, a theory. Um, but it's sort of empirical. It's an empirical theory that predicts shape. And it does predict. Okay, 
but it's not rested in um, sort of good fundamental principles, okay? The basic assumption here is that electrons repel each other Okay, so that sounds good. Electrons do repel each other. I'll just say it's physically inaccurate. I don't exactly know what I mean by that. I guess what I mean is, you know, it's sort of a um, kindergarten explanation of molecular sh shape or, or kindergarten based principles. It's not very sophisticated. But it works well. Theorists, uh, you know, people are sometimes very attracted to the simplest explanation of things. Um, uh, but that doesn't always mean it's right. Okay. But it works. And um, for the sake of its utility, that's good. All right. So it works well for molecules with small coordination numbers. All right, so let's take a look at an example. Uh, I guess I should say, especially main group. All right, so let's take a look here. So I just wanna make a distinction here. This, a Lewis structure, does not imply geometry. Now, the VSEPR structure does. It's an indicator of molecular shape. People will do this kind of thing. And This is an indication here that uh, the shape that the hydrogens in this molecule take on the tetrahedral angle. Which is 109.5. Note that the experimental angle is not 109.5. It's less than that. One hundred seven point three. Okay, so what's going on with that? VSEPR theory says, well, that's because lone pairs are bigger than bond pairs, and they take up more space. It has more to do with hybridization principles and how S and P orbitals like to partition themselves. Um, but VSEPR says lone pairs take up more space. And so they push, pushing the hydrogens down away from the idealized angle, okay? So the idealized angle is defined by something called the steric number. And in ammonia, the steric number is four. 
because it has a lone pair, which is one and three bonds makes four. Okay, so let's do another one. Um, sulfur, whoops, not trichloride. Sulfur dichloride. Let's draw a Lewis structure. Everybody's got an octet there. Sulfur's got two bonds, just like H2S. So that looks good. Let's give it some VSEPR. What's the chlorine sulfur chlorine angle? Well, this thing has a steric number of four, two lone pairs, two bond pairs, that's four things to pack around the sulfur. So the ideal angle is 109.5 degrees, like it would be for CH4. Um, and these uh, electron pairs are said to push the chlorines away. So this angle here is going to be less than the tetrahedral angle. because of that. Let's do another one. SF4. What's the steric number? To know the steric number, you've got to draw out a Lewis structure and count those Electron pairs. So we got four bonds, that's an octet. If we split those guys in half, that would leave four behind on sulfur. We need two more than that. I need to have an electron pair up there. So here's our octet, or sorry, here's our Lewis structure. This guy has an expanded Octet, don't draw that on your homework. Violates octet rule. So of course you can draw something that looks like this. And now we're down to an octet on sulfur. There are four of these. Resonant, natural resonance structures. Now, <clears throat> what shape is this thing gonna take? Steric number, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, you got four bonds and a lone pair is steric number of five. And what shape is five? Steric number of five, what's the ideal shape? trigonal bipyramid. Okay. So there's two ways to write a trigonal bipyramid for SF4. One of them is where the lone pair is on top in an axial position. And the other one is where it's not on top, but in an equatorial position. So, which of these is correct? An axial lone pair here has three 90 degree interactions between the bond pairs and the lone pairs. So three bond pair, lone pair interactions at 90 degrees 
And then here we've got two bond pair, lone pair interactions at 90 degrees and two at 120 degrees. Okay. Turns out this one is favored, this guy on the right. Uh, those 120 degree angles really work for sulfur. And so um, the one on the right has a better via CPR geometry than the one on the left. Okay. Unless you really understand the theory of bond pair, lone pair repulsion, maybe it would be hard to know that. Um, there is no really understand the bond pair, lone pair theory. You just remember lone pairs prefer equatorial positions and trigonal bipyramids. Okay. So <clears throat> if I look at these angles, I would say, First of all, um, if it were this molecule on the left here, this fluorine fluorine angle is going to be less than 90 degrees. This fluorine fluorine angle is going to be equal to 120 degrees. I actually, that's not true. It's going to be slightly less than 120 degrees. And these guys are going to be greater than 90 degrees. And that's all because the lone pair pushes the fluorines away from it and it compresses the molecule uh, in the downward direction and that shrinks the angles from 120 and 90. Same thing on the right. This fluorine fluorine angle is gonna be less than 90 degrees. And this fluorine fluorine angle is gonna be less than 120 degrees. Let's see here. Somebody have a question? Somebody had a question. Can we use Fisher projections to see if the atoms are equatorial? You may draw the molecule as you see fit. Uh, and it is, I will say, a very good idea to redraw things in a manner that um, makes them easy to see, particularly from a different orientation, as you will see in our section on symmetry. Okay, let's do another one. CLF3. All right, we got a chlorine. That brings seven electrons. We got three fluorines. It's 21 electrons or 28 electrons total. Let's draw this guy out. We got chlorine here. Let's connect these fluorines first. We use three of chlorine's seven electrons to make bonds. So that means there's two more electrons on that chlorine. And you can see we've got two, four, six, eight, ten electrons around chlorine. So really what you want to do is to write a structure that doesn't violate the octet rule. Okay, now, what's the steric number here? Anybody? Steric number equals five. We've got two electron pairs and three bonds. Okay, so five things you've got to pack around. And again, this is a trigonal bipyramid. So 
There are three possible ways to write a trigonal bipyramid here. One where you have an electron pair axial and an electron pair equatorial. Another where both electron pairs are equatorial. And another Yikes. another where the electron pairs are axial. Okay, so which of these is the best? Well, one thing to consider is the fact that we have a 90 degree angle between our lone pairs that's bad here we've got 120 degrees between lone pairs and we have four lone pair bond pair interactions at 90 degrees. Okay. Each one of these is a 90 degree lone pair bond pair interaction, two for each fluorine. <clears throat> Here, we've got 180 degrees between lone pairs, so that's good. But we have six lone pair bond pair 90 degrees, so that's bad, okay? So this guy here turns out to be the experimental structure. Okay, so um, it's better to have those lone pairs at least 120 degrees apart. Um, you know, getting to 180 is not so good, not that much of a benefit uh, if you're forced to pick up two more lone pair bond pairs at 90. Now, again, weighing all of those things is kind of hard to remember. It's a little bit easier just to remember that um, you put the electron pairs in an equatorial arrangement when you have two of them in a steric number of five. Let's do another one. OSF4. Now, if I gave you that problem and, I, and you were to look at it and say, what is that thing? There's a lot of different ways you could arrange the atoms. It's best to put the least electronegative atom in the middle. Okay, so in that case, that would be sulfur. Um, and so if I put the sulfur here and I start drawing some fluorines around it, and an oxygen, put a double bond in place because I know oxygen needs at least two bonds. Let's count it up. One, two, three, four, five, six bonds around sulfur. Um, six, sulfur's got six electrons to give, so no lone pairs on sulfur. We've got some lone pairs on the other elements, of course. If you're really unsure of yourself, you can write out Six electrons for oxygen. Sulfur contributes six electrons. We've got four fluorines for a total of 36. No, darn it, 28. 28 electrons. So 40 electrons total. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 21, 20, 
32, 24, 26, 28, 30, 32, 34, 36, 38, 40. Looks good. Let's draw some resonance structures. So this is a problem. We got too many electrons around sulfur and its valence shell can't accommodate all those covalent bonds. So something's got to give. And uh, it looks like we have to lose two bonds to get to a reasonable structure. So you could pop off two fluorines if you wanted to. Give those electron pairs to the fluorine, give it a minus charge, put a two plus on your sulfur. And there are four of these. You might say, well, double bond, not as good as a single bond. So maybe a better thing to do would be to push one of the electron pairs off the oxygen or onto the oxygen from the sulfur. Now we have a negative charge out there and out there, and we still have a two plus on sulfur. That guy looks pretty good. I also have four of these. You know, you could also do something like this if you wanted. Just pull off an oxygen. Now you got an O2 minus floating out there. So this is less good, obviously, because you've got a two minus charge. You don't need to do that. So that sort of charge arrangement is less desirable. Okay. And so I would say that the two of these are the best descriptions. Negative charges on fluorine, better than negative charges on oxygen, but you're trading that for a double bond versus a single bond. So I like that. I think both of those are good. Okay, now what's the VSCPR structure gonna be? Um, so how do I do that now? What's the steric number? Now the easiest way to do this is to look at the um, the, the drawing that's just the, the one that has the expanded octet, okay? Count up the number of things around it. There's no lone pairs and this double bond doesn't really matter. It's just, this still only counts for one. So that means one, two, three, four, five, steric number of five. So trigonal bipyramid again. Uh, so um, it turns out that a double bond kind of works like a lone pair in via CPR theory, but it's not quite as demanding as a lone pair. Oh, Amir, six resonance structures instead of four in the second Lewis structure. Um, you're referring to this one over here, I assume, when you say the second, or do you mean this one? This one, probably. Yeah, so if we pin this, then we do one, two, three, then move it there, then we do three, four, and then we move it here, then we get five, right? Three, two, no, sorry. You're right, it is six. I'll update my notes. Thank you. So six of these there. All right, let's do the VSEPR structure. Um, trigonal bipyramid with a double bond, there's two different ways, orientations to put the double bond. There's the equatorial version.
And there's the axial version. Please raise your hand if you think that the structure on the left is the correct one. Where's my participants list? Not a lot of hands being raised on the participants list. There we go. Anybody else? Three? More people. Okay. All right. Yeah, so. Sorry. Can I ask a question, Professor? Sure, go ahead, Mac. Um, so are you asking, but we're looking to see if the lone pairs are equatorial or axial, right? Well, there's no lone pairs in this structure. Right. So you're asking us like, like the, the, we're going to be, are we looking to the oxygen then to see if the oxygen is equ, uh, equatorial or axial? Yeah, those are the two possible structures to consider. Um, okay. And one of them is the experimental structure. And many of you uh, like that one, the, this, the molecule on the left, where'd you go? Many of you do not. So um, the molecule on the left is, or the structure on the left is the experimental structure. For the same reasons the lone pair one was when we did CLF uh, four, I think. No, we didn't do CLF four, we did SF four. So the, the, the double bond is kind of like a lone pair. It's less um, impinging than a lone pair is, but more so than a single bond pair. And so you only have two 90 degree interactions on the left, whereas on the right, you have three of them. So this thing on the left is better. And the actual angles here are 99.8 degrees. These guys are 122.9 degrees. And these guys are 114.1 degrees. Okay. So double bond takes up more space or it goes in the equatorial position. Okay, so you're gonna see lots of problems on your homework. You've got to go through and um, make those assignments uh, indicating what the bond angles are. Um, normally, I would teach you about electronegativity in this context, and I'm not going to do that because we're behind. But there's this thing called Bent's Rule. Maybe I'll come back to it later. Um, that helps you to see the shape. All right, so let's see. I'm going to transition now, and we're going to start talking about um, symmetry. This is a pretty extensive part of this class. Um, symmetry is really powerful. It's, it's used to do all kinds of stuff. Um, one of the things you can do with it is analyze electronic structure. Um, another is spectra. Infrared and, and UV viz spectra can be analyzed with, uh, with symmetry. Uh, this, whoops, here, let's undo. Yikes. Let's try this again. Structure and say electronic spectra. And really, it's just by relating parts of the molecule of interest to other parts using what are called symmetry elements.
So Amir asks, when we draw the VSCPR structure, should we include the electrostatic interactions from the Lewis structure so as not to violate the octet rule? I would say yes, the simplest thing to do on your homework is to draw an appropriate Lewis structure that does not violate the octet rule and then indicate the angles uh, on that structure. Okay. So what's a symmetry element? So symmetry element is a, um, a point, a line, or a plane that relates two parts of the molecule that relate to Do some examples. There's another here, another thing that you need to know about called symmetry operations. Symmetry operations are transformations that move things. into a new orientation but importantly it has to be an equivalent the orientation that is equivalent to its original one okay so something has a plane of reflection symmetry and you apply that operation where you reflect the molecule it has to look like it did before you did the operation or else it's not a symmetry element. That makes sense. Or yeah, that, that plane is not a symmetry element if it doesn't retrieve the um, equivalent orientation. All right, so let's take a look at some types of symmetry operations we're gonna be working with here. The first one is a little bit annoying, but it's um, for mathematical rigor, something called the identity operation. And it gets the symbol E. I'm gonna write some squiggly lines beneath the E there that indicates bold. This is what we're gonna call the do nothing operation. It's annoying, but if you just bear with me here, the do nothing operation is a transformation where nothing changes and you get back the exact same structures you did before. It's for mathematical completeness, as you will see. So we're gonna add it there. Another one is um, reflection through a plane. This guy gets the symbol sigma. Okay, so for example, let's do a sigma plane for a hypothetical substance, which is a pretty scary looking molecule to me. This difluorophosphine. You can see there's a plane of symmetry here relating the front and the back. This bold wedge implies the fluorine is coming out of the page. And so the fluorine with the bold wedge is in front of this plane of symmetry. And the one in the hashed mark in the back behind it, we're gonna give these fluorines a label. 
one and two. So that plane there is the sigma plane and we're going to apply this operation. And we're gonna get back that up a little bit. We're going to get back the same looking structure, but now fluorines one and two have traded places. The symmetry operation moves fluorine two to the front and fluorine one to the back. And if we did it again, the same operation, now, We'd swap them again. Okay, so a sigma plane sends the back of the molecule to the front, to the front of the molecule to the back. Now the molecule is the same orientation, except that the fluorines, the labels have moved. Okay, so notice how applying um, two sigma operations just gives back the original. Um, this is equivalent to saying sigma times sigma is equal to do nothing. Okay, remember this E is the do nothing operation. If we apply two planes of symmetry here, we get back the original orientation of the fluorines. If I were to do the do nothing operation, I would get that same thing. So they say two of these back to back is the same as the do nothing. All right, let's take a look at another one here. Rotation about an axis about an axis of symmetry is given this symbol here, CN. This is sometimes called a proper rotation. Very, very proper rotation. And <clears throat> let's do an example here. One of my favorite molecules. This is a two minus complex tetrachloroplatinate. Really beautiful red colored crystal, blood red color. Let's put some labels on here. We're gonna make this chlorine number one. This chlorine number two, that guy chlorine number three, and that guy chlorine number four. This is a square planar compound. All of those chlorines are 90 degrees apart from each other. And if you were to skewer this and make some barbecue, we're gonna put a C2 operation, a C2 symmetry axis through a chlorine four, platinum and chlorine two. And then we can spin that molecule about that axis and recover the same geometry. And this is a C2 axis because the two denotes how far you rot rotate it compared to 360 degrees. So if n is one, it's 360 degree rotation. n is two is a 180 degree rotation. n is three is 120. So we're gonna do a C2, which moves some stuff around.
the chlorines that are on the axis don't go anywhere. They get the same. But 180 degree rotation is going to send chlorine 1 to where chlorine 3 was and vice versa. So CN rotation. I should say CN rotates. Three hundred and sixty over n degrees. Okay. Now this molecule has other symmetry axes. Let's do another one. One, two, three, four. Let's see, did I forget my two minus up here? I sure did. Gotta be careful to include those charges. All right, anybody else see another symmetry axis here? Go ahead and shout it out if you do. It goes uh, from top to bottom, like above the platinum down like capsule it goes up and down vertical. You got it. Let's do that one. There's one that is orthogonal to the plane of the molecule. Okay. And that's a C4 axis because you rotate it 90 degrees. 360 divided by four is 90 degrees. So what does that look like? Now we got to shift these things over by one. Those guys jump by one. You know what? I'm going to do this twice just to make a point here. Here's another C4 operation. I'm going to do it again. You can see if I were to do this one more time, I'd be able to go around the ring. So you can just do one, two, three, four, C4 operations if you wanted to. C4 times C4 times C4 times C4 is equal to the do nothing operation. Now, another useful one here to consider is that you can take this structure all the way down to this structure. Oops, a little neater than that. How do you do that? Well, one way you could do it is with a C2.
what's a C2? C2 is 180 degree rotation. So if I just take the same line here and I do 180 degree twist instead of a 90 degree twist, that does two C4s back to back. So C4 times C4 is actually equal to a C2. Okay. Somebody asked if these have a direction associated with them. They do, um, but it's sort of a convention that the user gets to pick. So you can't change directions, right? If you're gonna go clockwise, you better stick with clockwise or else this doesn't make sense really. You can't go willy nilly. All right, another way that you could write all this stuff out if you wanted to is to say C4 to the fourth power is actually equal to C2 to the second power, which is also equal to E. Or if you wanted to, for some reason, you could write C4 times C4 to the third power equals E. Doesn't really matter um, the order in which you apply them. Okay, so some important definitions. Um, if you apply two operations in succession and they get back the original structure, they're said to be each other's inverse, okay? So an example of that is um, C2 times C2 gives you E, okay? And people say, therefore, C2 is equal to C2 minus one. In other words, C2 is its own inverse. It undoes itself. Okay, you could also say, and C4 times C4 to the third power equals E, and therefore, uh, C4 Those guys are inverses. Okay, let's do another one. Improper rotation. These are given the symbol S and they have a subscript N to denote the number of degrees that you do the rotation. Um, but they're more than just a rotation. It's a rotation followed by a reflection. Rotation followed by a reflection through a plane. And that plane <clears throat> must be orthogonal. that axis. These can be tough to spot sometimes. Let's do a, a classic example. Um, Aline is a classic example. Yikes. Allene is one of these cool molecules where because you've got the two sp2s stacked side by side like that, you get this cool shape where two of the hydrogens are in the plane of the paper and two of the hydrogens are in front and in back. So we're going to give this guy some labels here. Keep track of those hydrogens. And this guy has an improper rotation. Okay. And it involves 
a C4 operation followed by a sigma. Okay, so let's, there's an S4 uh, improper rotation here. I'm gonna show it to you in just a minute. So we're gonna do, start off with our C4. Now, where's the C4 oriented? So the C4 is oriented along the carbon, carbon, carbon vector. So when I do a 90 degree rotation, let me just specify here, I'm gonna rotate it like that. That's gonna move this hydrogen down here and this hydrogen up there. And it's gonna bring that hydrogen. Nope, got that backwards. In front of the page and behind the page. So I've got to be careful to think about consistent direction of rotation to get that right. Now the reflection orthogonal to this axis is gonna run through the molecule. And it's gonna reflect the left and the right sides of the molecule. So now we're gonna send this H3 in front over to the left-hand side. And it's still gonna be in front. And the H4, which is in back, still gonna be in back. Now this H1, which is on bottom, is still gonna be on bottom. And there you go. Now the structure down, down here on the lower right is the same as the structure up here on the upper left. Left-hand side, there's a hydrogen in front and back. Right-hand side, there's a hydrogen in the page. But the labels have moved. This thing here is called an S4. Now, I'll tell you, these things are pretty useful because um, you could use them to define whether or not a molecule is chiral. Molecules that lack improper rotations are said to be chiral. Okay. Very important thing here. You might be saying to yourself, wait a minute, I thought it's just the plane of symmetry thing that we need to be concerned about. Um, it turns out that an S1 is equal to a sigma, right? An S1 is in a case where you do a 360 degree rotation, which is equivalent to doing nothing, followed by a plane of reflection. So S1 is the same thing as a plane of reflection. Molecules that lack planes of reflection can be chiral or are chiral. Okay, so let's let's take a look at another one here. Inversion centers. They have given the symbol I. Simplest way to write this out is with linear algebra. Take something that has coordinates x, y, and z. When you apply an inversion operation to them, it comes back with coordinates negative x, negative y, and negative z. And uh, an example of that. Here, we're gonna do ethane in its gauche conformation. I give these guys a 1A, 
one B, one C. Oh, I did that wrong. I sure did that wrong. Let's try that again. Give this a one A, a two A, and a three A. And give this a one B, two B, a three B. There we are. So let's do an inversion operation. Inversion operation is going to take all of these things and do the, um, but you can think about it really as a point, okay? So envision a point in the middle of this molecule here, and we're going to send all parts of the molecule to the exact opposite side of that point. So we're going to get a new ethane. Now 1A and 3B are going to swap places, opposite sides. 1B and 3A are going to swap places. And 2B and 2A are going to swap places. Now, um, it turns out inversion operations are actually the same as doing a C2 followed by a sigma. So let's do a C2. Where is that C2 axis here? C2 axis is actually going to be right here. Supply a C2 along that direction. That's going to send H1A down here and H3B up there. going to send 1B down there and 2B back there. And it's going to send 2A back up there and not, yes, 3A back that way. And then if we take a mirror plane here and we reflect the left and the right hand side, of the molecule, we'll get the thing in the upper right. Okay, so I is equivalent to a C2 followed by a sigma. And does anybody else see another thing it's equivalent to? Is it S2? It's an S2, right? We did a rotation of a C2 followed by a reflection orthogonal to that rotational axis. That is the same thing as an improper rotation. Okay, so I is equivalent to S2, which is equivalent to C2 uh, followed by a reflection. So there's a little bit of redundancy here. Um, and it helps you to see how using an S as a definition of chirality is rigorous. Um, you know, inversion center is another one of the ways people sometimes analyze whether a thing is chiral or not, and it's not chiral if it has a, an inversion center. Um, that's the same thing as having an S2. All right, so next time we're going to show how the collections of these things um, add up to groups. And these groups can be used to classify molecules uh, and do all kinds of fun stuff. That is called group theory. And um, we're going to be hitting this for a while now. So it's time to delve into that part of the reading. Um, and um, uh, yeah, we'll see where that leads. So I'm going to stop now since it's 1255. And I'm happy to stick around and answer questions people might have.
No question. So I have a, I have a question. I have, I have okay. a question about um, yeah about counting counting the resonance structures like in the or anytime we're doing the the Lewis dot structure um, like when you look at them and you say four of these like I'm not sure how to count like the combinations or the patterns of the bonds how you're doing that. Okay, um, let's go back and do an example. So if I back up to say, um, let's go back to this oxy sulfur tetrafluoride again, a case, okay? OSF4. Um, and maybe I'll just share my screen again. Okay, so really, oh, there we go. Um, this is a nice example where you know you've got two of these dotted lines. How do you get to six? So one of the things I'll do is I'll I'll just start by taking this dotted line and putting it up here and fixing it in that position, and then asking where do I put the next one? So if I have one dotted line here then I can say I could put it here, here, or here. That's three. Now, let's take the dotted line and put it here. Where else can I put it to get a new structure? You can put it here or here. You can't put it there because that regenerates the one where you have a dotted line in that position. Okay, so let's do it again. Let's now put the dotted line here and ask where can we put the other one? And it's there. Okay. You can't put it there because okay. that regenerates the you know the one we just did, or there because that regenerates the one we did another round before that. So you end up with one bond there and three, one bond there and two, one bond there and one. And so it's really three factorial. Three plus two plus one gets you to six. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So so you're just it's three factorial. So anytime I count the bonds, I, just, I can do a factorial and it'll give me a number of combinations for those bonds. Probably that's true, but I, you know, that's a, I'm not prepared to make that generalization without actually looking at the example. <laughs> but, okay. you know, okay. I think in general, if you have two to move around, you know, you can put one in one position and then count the other positions and then move it to the next one and count the others. And, you know, probably you'll get you know, some factorial of the number of bonds that are available. Um, and, you know, uh, the only complication, of course, is that the equatorial, equatorial and axial fluorines in these molecules are not equivalent because it's trigonal bipyramidal. Now, my Lewis structure doesn't account for the shape, but it should if you were really counting equivalent resonance structures. But we're not going to ding you on that stuff. Okay. All right. Um, well, that was kind of a question I had working on. I have one more question unless Emmerlein wants to ask something on and I'll be quiet if you just listen. Why don't you go ahead, Max? Um, so the other question is, you answered the central, the central atom, how to pick the central atom. I had that question last night. But then the other one I have is about so when I'm getting the electron configuration for a particular atom, and a lot of times like in the D block, if you have like um, some of the, if it goes past the D block all the way through, then it's gonna have 10 electrons uh, for, the, for its D orbital, like whether it's like, you know, three or four typically. Um, but when I'm counting the valence electrons out of that electron configuration, I'm only using the S and P orbitals, I don't use a fill D orbital to count those for the valence. Or do can I? you tell me which, um, yeah, I'm having yeah, a hard sure. time me, following uh, unless I know the example. Okay, uh, let me go here. So where's one of them where I was wondering it? I wrote it down. Don't violate up to it. So, for instance, uh, arsenic, okay, that's argon 4s2, 3d10, 
4p3. But if I'm counting bonding electrons, like the valence electrons are going to be involved in like bonding, you know, when I'm trying to uh, find out how many electrons for to do the Lewis dot structure, mm -hmm. I'm not going to use 15 electrons for that. I'm using five. No, right. Yeah. 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 Okay. So basically the issue here is that the um, noble gas configuration of the shell is it has to include the 3d10 i think wait a minute did i do that wrong um, well that's a good point um so the d10 so ar arsenic does not use the d electrons in making bonds they are considered valence electrons Sorry, they are considered core electrons. Okay, okay, so the valence electrons in arsenic are really just the 4s and the um, 4p. And that would be common for any of these questions. That would be what I would find for any of the questions in this this problem set. Yeah, I mean, once you fill up a, with the exception of s orbitals, once you fill up a collection of orbitals, um, like all the Ds, they tend not to get involved in bonding. There are exceptions to that, like copper, silver, and gold. Uh, probably there are others, but those are the main ones I can think of. Um, and, and that's because you, know, you can excite the, uh, the S, I'm sorry. I'm just saying. Yeah, I mean, the, the reason is that the once you jump from one principal quantum number to the next, which is what happens when you fill up the P's or the D's, um, you know, you get you you get to a higher energy principal quantum number, and the electrons are further from the nucleus, and suddenly they're more easily ionized, and the orbitals are bigger, so they they participate in bonding at that point. Um, so generally, once you have a T D10 shell, you know, and then electrons on top of that, only the electrons on top of that get involved in bonding. Um, there are exceptions with copper, silver, and gold, but not as you go further to the right. So, you know, the main group elements are really only the S and P orbitals. Okay. Um, zinc, right. cadmium, and mercury are really only the S and P orbitals or the S orbitals, um, not the Ds. Okay, so arsenic, the electron, the valence electron count for arsenic uh, is five, just like phosphorus and nitrogen even though it has a D electron shell filled beneath. Yeah, and it's tied to, like you said, because the, the principal numbers are different. It's 3D and then there's 4S and 4P. Mm -hmm. And so the S orbital is more easily, like the P orbital would has empty spots to, to bond. And then if the R stick itself were going to bond with another p orbital its s orbital would be more easily excited to take one of those electrons and bond with the other atoms yeah 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 orbital. that's right and the the other way to think about it too is that s orbitals are better at bonding they're more radially radially extensive than p so they tend to participate more effectively in bonding okay so even though it's lower in energy it's a better it's better at overlapping and so um, S's are kings of bonding. Um, okay. So, yeah. So, you know, generally speaking, people consider the S's and the P's as valence orbitals in the main group. And there are exceptions to that to some extent, like especially when you go down toward the bottom, um, bismuth and lead, you'll find that you get these uh, lone pairs and the lone pairs that sit in the S orbitals are kind of so low that they, they're so, sort of inert, they're pseudo core levels. And, um, and then you get intermediate valences, you'll start doing um, lead two instead of normally, lead is in the carbon column. And so normally carbon will make four bonds and use up all of its four electrons. Lead often makes compounds where it only uses two electrons to make bonds because the 6s is so low. And they call that the inert pair effect. Um, or, um, yeah, in any case, uh, as you go down, that 
S orbital starts dropping lower and lower because of its penetration to the nucleus and the high effective nuclear charge. And uh, it becomes more core-like. But generally people talk about um, an S and three Ps as being the relevant valence orbitals for the main group. Professor, I had one yeah. quick question yeah, go ahead. Um, about the homework. So following the rules that you yeah, gave us last week, right? Really, um, so the first rule you said was begin by drawing a single bonded structure, right? So mm -hmm. um, with respect to the N5 plus, you said it's not cyclic, right? Um, mm -hmm. So I started drawing it as tetrahedral, as a tetrahedral structure. And, um, you know, the, cha the charges, the formal charges aren't balancing out. So at that point, I go on to um, go on to like add the pi bonds and, you know, follow down the list. Does like, does the charges always have to balance? Yeah, I think you're going to have a hard time getting the right answer for that molecule with that starting geometry. So you should pick a different one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, because I was and, like, and following so, the you rules. know, how would you know? How would you know? Well, you know, because you're looking at the thing and asking yourself, this is not making very much sense. No. Right? Yeah. So, um, you should try a different shape. Okay. So, um, in essence, I always have to make sure that I have that plus charge and try different shapes, play around with them. Um, and I don't always have to start off with a single bond if it doesn't make sense in terms of the balancing the charges yeah i think you know i'm asking you to be a little more um uh i want you to be able to look at your drawing and um look at the drawing and say is this reasonable right, right? like is am i coming up with something that makes sense and yeah. i think the tetrahedral case that you're working with is not going to get you there. Uh, and it's good, you can see that. So, um, you know, you have to be able to pivot from that and in turn try and draw a different shape. That's sort of one of the challenging things about that exercise is you, you're forced to get the right shape uh, by reasoning in the way that you did, right? <laughs> so um, hopefully that's helpful. Thank you very much, Professor. Yeah, no problem. Oh, right, and um, the website was updated. I saw that I can see the third editions. Um, okay, yeah, I mean, it's, I think that that must have just been like the mobile part of it being slower to update than the web-based part. I don't know. Um, I, I uh, yeah, I'm glad you raised that though. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Professor. Bye now. Bye. All right, so that was a little bit better today. Um, we got further. I felt better about the pace. And uh, I don't know if there's more to say. Do you, do you have any thoughts about where are we? Uh, I don't know why. Um, so we are going to uh, exclude the uh, Point group in the midterm or not? In the midterm exam? Yeah. Um, I'm tempted to reschedule it. Okay. Because okay. Yeah. I think it makes more sense to stick with the same midterm structure and just pick a different exam date. And I don't think anybody's going to get upset about that. So um, maybe I'll announce that on Wednesday. Uh, I, I'd like to kind of see where the class is with respect to because I, I got into lecture four notes today, um, which is good. So now we're only a few pages behind. Um, and the presence of that holiday and the schedule right before the midterm still presents a problem. So what I might need to do is um, postpone it, which means that it would be on Wednesday, the week after the midterm. And or after spring break, but I think that's fine because they don't have to worry about studying for it over the you know they can study for it after spring break. <laughs> so I think I think just doing it a week later is the right thing to do. So I'm going to announce that. Um, so if we do that now, 
homework one is due on Wednesday. And if so, let's make homework three due the 24th. You can hand it out on the 17th. Okay. You can make okay. homework two do the 10th and hand it out on the third. Okay. Sorry, I know that we just rearranged the dates, but right. you know, I don't think it's gonna impact them. It just means we have to go up the date, update the website again. Um, and then we don't have to rearrange the content of the homeworks and we don't have to, I think this will make sense. Is that okay with you? Yeah. All right, so then you don't have to have homework two done until Wednesday of next week, which is nice because you basically have it done now. We could put the D3H problem back in um, and then uh, you'll have time to grade and everything. Is that okay? Okay, I see. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm gonna go ahead and announce that on Wednesday. If you wanna make changes uh, to the website before then you can, but I think Let's, let's just, let's go forward with that path, okay? All right.